Good evening, good evening, and welcome to Three Bocker, a ball and blitz board. I'm sat here, as usual, in Workshop 17, who have a brand new venue up in Rosebank, up in uh, up in Gauteng. Check it out. Oh, my word, it's amazing. They're doing a uh, one-day free trial for anybody who wants to use the uh, facilities. It's got a bar, which is always a winner. Um, it's got a cafe, and this space is incredible absolutely insane a great place to start co-working check it out workshop 17 let's get into this uh, show tonight we've got an incredible incredible show for you tonight um i'm not even gonna you've already seen who the guests are on the poster but i'm gonna wait until uh, they're ready to come on for me to introduce them one by one but for now i just want you to sit back and wait to relax and welcome to dreebocker Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob, good morning. Good morning. Good evening. As you can see, I'm on my own tonight. Mr. Mason, Mr. The G-Man himself, the legend, can't unfortunately make it tonight. Don't worry. He's fine. He's all good. He's just got a bucket load of work on. But we'll miss you, G-Man, but we've got loads to get through tonight. We have got women's rugby coming out of our ears tonight, so I'm just going to get straight into it. First guest, former Blue Bull, Ulster, Ireland women, an absolute machine on the field. Please welcome Ilsa van Staden. Hi guys, how are you? Evening, Ilza, how are you? I'm really good uh, here in Northern Ireland. <laughs> Locked down. Locked down, yeah. indeed. Well, everyone's everyone's winning about South Africa, but we're out and about. Um, so uh, my next guest is here in South Africa. He is a man that heads up the Southwest District Women's Rugby Program, um, and I am really, really pleased. I, I I've been trying to find a show to get Ashin on for ages and I'm so pleased that this is the perfect one. So please welcome Ashin Klein. Hi, good evening How everyone. How are you I'm mate? All good. I'm all good, all good. I, uh, Ilza is locked down, we are locked out now. Yeah. <laughs> out and about. <laughs> but, we, but we can buy beer tomorrow, which is a, a new thing for us. Um, and then finally, I'm really, really, it's a real privilege to have this lady on tonight. She's obviously a former Ireland international. But in the last two weeks, in fact, while we were on air two weeks ago, she was appointed as the new head of high performance women's rugby in South Africa here. So what an opportunity to pick this lady's brain. Please welcome Lynn Cantwell. Hi, everybody. Uh, hey, Lynn. thanks for wrapping up extremely warm to join us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, huge congratulations on the on the new position here in South Africa. You must be ecstatic. Yeah, look, it's um, it's a a cool position to be in. Not for myself, I think, but more just South African rugby, I think, and just their intention and their commitment, I I think, and their want to. Um, develop the women's game and, and to take it in a, in a direction, a performance direction. So, yeah, an exciting time to be involved. Yeah, awesome. Ashley, I'm going to jump straight in with you because obviously you're involved with what's happening in women's rugby right now in South Africa. I see that you've, you've, you've got some high performance camps going on at the moment. It's all over Facebook. They're great. I love watching your posts. How, how's the landscape looking for you guys at the moment and how's the development of the women's game in the Southwest District going? Um, good evening, um, Len, and first of all, congratulations with the appointment. We're looking forward to working with you, taking rugby, women's rugby to the next level here. Um, yeah, we are blessed in SWD. Um, we are lucky enough to have one of the YTC um, centers um, in SWD. So from a development point of view, we are lucky because we have the platform where um, girls rugby is developed from... Uh, primary school age already. Um, but yeah, coming from lockdown, coming from COVID, it's looking exciting um, for the next season. We have got to receive the go-ahead to start training soon. Um, 
our training group is out and we will be starting with one-on-one -on -one training and in a month's time we will um, join as a group. That's superb. Ilza, you must be missing training at the moment in uh, lockdown. Yeah. Well, there's no rugby. Um, uh, I'm lucky enough to to have uh, some training training facility at my house, but it's just yeah. Uh, you 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 really miss the intensity. Oh, that's a really old photo. Um, <laughs> that's, that's about ten years ago. It's the last time I played for the Bulls. Um, so yeah, in, in Northern Ireland, we are not doing anything at the minute due to lockdown restrictions. Uh, we are hoping that it will be eased from the 1st of April so that we can go back to some form of um, structured group training. But uh, we, we, we are hoping, and it's all down to what our executive says uh, is going to happen. And it's, it, it is trying, trying, to be, um, trying to be good and keeping up with training is, is rather difficult in, in, in this day and age. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to ask you one question before we, we, we sort of try and uh, break into how, how, how Lynn's journey is about to, to begin. You've obviously played both sides now. You've played you've played in, in Ireland a lot and you, you used to play for the Bulls. And listen, the, the world's moved on since sort of 10 years ago since you were here. But in comparison, what, what, what do you feel that potentially Lynn could be taking out of the Irish game and really planting straight in for quick wins maybe in South Africa? Um, um, like I said, I've, I haven't played rugby in South Africa in, in 10 years. Um, by the time that I left, um, there was a big focus within the Bulls on sevens with um, the development of Tux, uh, who I played for as well. So there was, a, there was a really big focus on sevens. And I do think that at that stage, that is where SA Rugby was going. They, they put a lot more effort into the sevens, and you could see that, especially after the 2014 World Cup, where the 15s game was basically, on international level, null and void. Um, there was no no South African particip uh, participation in the 2017 World um, Rugby World Cup here in Ireland, and I think they only started playing uh, 15s international rugby in 2019 again. So five years of, of being out in the international cold. Um, in Ireland, there, there's a big focus on, on club structure and how clubs play. Um, where in South Africa, there's a much bigger focus on the provincial side. And um, again, when I played for the Bulls, we used to train two nights a week at our club setup. We used to train two nights a week at provincial setup. So I was busy with rugby four nights a week and then playing on a Saturday. Um, whereas in Northern Ireland and Ulster, especially, there's not that big a focus on on the provincial game. We literally train for about two months, two and a half months before the Interpros, which is literally three games. And after that, we just go back to our clubs and it will be a two night a week session. A training session um, set up, and um, you are you are responsible for all your own f um, fitness and strength and conditioning at club level. Yeah, cool. Let's let's move on to to Lynn and and the new job. So, um, Lynn, how did it all happen? How did it How did it all arise? Did Rassi just ring you one day, Yuri Ru, just casually asking for a job, or? Um, how did how did this all come about? Um, yeah, look, I think um, mid twenty nineteen, I think there was a kind of strategic decision within Saru to try and focus on on the women's game, and and whether or not that was triggered by Rassi going up to director of rugby, and obviously this was pre World Cup. Um, but I think at, afterwards, they when when he did officially shift, I think they they started to look around for people that would um understand how how to kind of approach this as such and um and they had approached a couple of people so kind of long story short i started working with them in uh just the start of this year um and i i think genuinely like the, the response has been in incredible and in, in that i do hear them saying that they really want to make a difference and they they're acknowledging that that they don't necessarily know how to approach it and they 
recognize that there's a lot of insights from a women's sport and a women in rugby point of view that are important to inform the decisions that we make around what kind of I say system I say system kind of lightly because I I, I think there's, there's um a rigidity around around the word system which I think is important that we kind of don't pre presume that just because we put framework down and an infrastructure down that that it'll just work I, I think what's important look and, and Ashen and Isla will know an awful lot more about this than than I do and um, is that I, I think we it's important whatever whatever kind of pathway or environment that we create needs to be specific to the girls that are going to run through it and um, so we need to really understand that and we need to be able to speak specifically to those girls um, and 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 create an environment whereby they're they're safe they're they're coached well they're encouraged to to think for themselves and and um, to try and, and generate and turn them into into good kind of healthy rugby players that that that's what you want at the top obviously so there's obviously lots of, of work to be done etc but um yeah the origins of it i think is like rassi and and charles vessels and obviously yuri behind it etc but like as i said any of the conversations that i'm having with all of the people within within saru have been really positive and, and they recognize lots of work that needs to be done at all levels not just playing and pathway but you know female coaches female referees female board members and um, female media all of these different things so it'll be a kind of a, a broad approach but ultimately the the performance of the national team will be the big marker and, and what is the brief what is the brief from rassi and yuri in 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 what 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 are the goals? What what sort of denotes success from you? So what what is the brief they've given you? Yeah, look, that's that's it's interesting because it's it's quite a carte blanche approach to be to be fair. But I suppose if you if you look to measure success, you're going to measure that on on the World Cups in 2025 and 2029 would have been more of the conversations around. Um, ultimately, like the girls are 14th in the world at the moment from a 15th point of view and a 13th and a 7th. So you'd hope to see that 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 change at, at those those each of those world cups um but i think it's important that we look at this developmentally as opposed to just performance because you know ashen will know how much work that that needs to be done and, and it needs to be meaningful as well like this is not a kind of short-term fix we need to invest into in a kind of a, a sustainable approach but i think there's just this huge piece around it being specific to the to the communities that are there and the the girls that are running through it and um, because you know ashen will only know that that is that that's unique to south africa so um so yeah as i said i'm not dodging the question of how do we calibrate it at all it's just that we have to actually write that the world cup would have been a, a good way good starting point to do that obviously but now that that's been changed if anything i think that south africa are in a better position with a year is more prep or six months more prep uh, to be able to do that because you know they're only at the start Mm. Ashin, what what's what's your relationship like with Saru currently? Um, do you feel you get get support that you need? Are they coming forward, or is it something that that you are actually desperate for? Andy, um, I'll take it uh, in a dual way. A few years back, ten years back, when Ilza left, um, support was limited. We had a better place at this moment um, with better support from SA Rugby um, in the means of um, the youth training centers, etc. Um, but there's a lot more that can be done. And I believe, um, as I listen to Lynn now, SA Rugby is in the right direction. And they, they have finally started to be intentional um, with their approach towards making South African women's rugby better. So I believe um, where we are now is about a quarter from where we are supposed to be but if we really work intentional um things can change um quickly but we are not uh, in a rush um like lynn said um we mustn't look at a quick fix we need to look long term and i believe that should be the the, the idea yeah and and from from your your perspective um I think it's fair to say in, in a lot of sport, women's, men's, uh, every sport in South Africa, there's a player drain, there's a, an athlete drain. You, you, we're not being able to tap into all of this talent. And how frustrating is that for you, Ashin, that, that you, they, these, we, it's obvious, there's, there's a lot of players falling through the net. 
that aren't even being seen in the first place? Um, yes, and I agree. Um, especially, um, we in South Africa have, um, we are lucky enough to have an uh, active league provincially, and most of the unions also have club structures. Um, but in the provincial league, we have two divisions, A division and a B division. Um, and for the first time, I've seen um, coaches looking at the B division um, during this process of selecting the squad towards the next World Cup. But I believe that is one of the places where um, some of the biggest cracks are. Um, all the girls are not playing against everyone. So they are not measured the same. Playing in the A division, you are you are looked at in a certain way because that is strength versus strength. And then a player playing in the B division are not looked at the same. Um, and we sit with a situation that a lot of talent um, is falling uh, through that cracks. Because if I look at SWD, we have, over the last three years since the YTC has been introduced, um, they, um, delivered a lot of, produced a lot of um, high-performance players into the national pathway system down the 16th Sahara week, or the Sahara squad, down the 18th Sahara high-performance squad, down the 20th squad. But because they're playing in the B division, somehow they are missed because they are not making the step up to the A division. And... One of my players, uh, based in Nice, who came through all those systems, um, was once told by someone, uh, it's not necessarily a coach or a player, but by someone that she need to move to an A division team in order to be um, eligible to play for the national squad. Now, that that is creating another problem. So I believe if we can really look and revisit um, the competition structure, we can change a lot. Um, in our approach and making um, the national teams uh, stronger. Um, mm. And then if you look at um, a lot of our girls are coming from townships and I've been in women's mm. rugby for the last 16 years. Um, and I have seen that if you go and look in, in the Eastern Cape, for instance, you'll find the strongest players mostly coming from that side. Border have been champions for the last five, six years before Western Province took over. Um, but they don't have the, the resources. They don't have the infrastructure. I remember a piece, um, I think it was on the Springbok social media, where our number one center in the country, Apiwe, um, was featured where she had to make hurdles from long grass in order to train. That is a kind of resources our elite centers have. So if we can nullify that, and that is something that I have identified uh, about 10 years back, um, that the pathway and the systems are not correct. And that's why we um, started up with the Titans Women's Rugby Academy that in the end led to players from this side starting getting opp better opportunities because they have better facilities and they have access to better coaching and that kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think you make a good point about the schools as well. There's a lot of schools in this country that will not touch women's rugby and that that... That's probably a, a bigger picture. And it's probably further down the line. But, Lynn, you, you've spoken quite... Uh, I've watched a few interviews, read a few interviews in the last week. Stuff so You've spoken about pipelines in SA. Um, I, I, you probably don't know how long those pipelines are yet until you actually get out here and, and, and looking at it. But those pipelines, I can assure you, run very deep into areas that um, people probably don't want to go to watch rugby. Let's be honest about it. So how important is... You now working with people like Ashin, because there's there's many Ashins around around the country, to find out how deep those pipelines are, because there is talent out there. Yeah, like I think that's the really exciting thing that um of the volume, like there's not a lot of countries that that have the potential. I think that South Africa does do. Um, but I think it's important, and, and I'm basing that on the fact that obviously their their boys' boy pipeline is obviously really rich um, in the players that they produce and the volume of players that they do produce. And in order to do that, you could say that we have to, like, I think there has to be like a massive community approach because we can't expect players to have to travel to, to regions as such. Um, but the ultimate would be that the, the 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 rugby that they have access to locally at least is aligned to the direction that it that it wants to go. But 
I think there's there's a couple of kind of key concepts or or key principles to to talk about when we talk about pathways. Um, as I said before, I think we'd be wrong to think that we can just lay down a pathway for one that is a lot of resource, but two and two that we'd be wrong to to just try and replicate what the men are doing, for example, or or like what a book is doing. Um, I think we have to try and be be smart about about that. And um, there's no doubt about there's some there's some basics. You know, we obviously want to. The ultimate would be to have have rugby introduced to girls <clears throat> in schools, and Ashen and, and Isla will know the 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 the, the resistance, not the resistance, but the, the challenges there. And um, but there's 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 some kind of positive things. I'd I'd hope that would be possible from that point of view. We know that it's important to capture girls um in the teenage years, but globally that's a problem as well. Is how do we get girls in in sport and how do we stop them? dropping off but there's there's if we understand it well i think we can we can definitely do that and then we obviously have the uh the, the post 18 gap uh in from club to provincial there's no under 20s representative and then there's that universities piece of that. so kind of at a structure level there's lots of those things but i think what's important that we from a woman's rugby point of view is that we have to acknowledge that like the system of sport by which we operate is 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 a system that that is completely not designed for 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 females, um, and that's not a bad thing at all. That's just historic. It's just that you know men have obviously been playing sport in all sports for for centuries and, and decades before women, and as a result, probably there's just a lack of understanding that the pathways that are there are are designed for men and not for girls and for women. So. You can't walk out your door when you're seven or eight or nine or ten for for a girl and actually go and access rugby or or anything like that. Those pathways are not there. Those teams are not there where they are there for boys. And as a result, the experience for boys through a pathway is very, very fluid. There's not much in the way. You literally just go from 10 to 11 to 12 to 13 and you just get competition, 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 competition. You learn, 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 learn and you get to the top. <clears throat> Whereas historically, we just don't have them at all for girls. So we have to acknowledge that the reason why girls get to national team or get to provincial level and they don't know how to pass off their left and right hand for 10 meters or they don't know how to kick or they don't understand how, tactically how to come back from a game or to play against a rush defense or whatever is that we there's just not the hours and the years and the rugby IQ there from a from a structural point of view so i think we have to look at that and not just think of it as it is as simple as putting down a pathway and it will be fine there's 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 insights that we have to kind of call on to understand like well what's behind that um and then look at it all individually and, and look at that that school age group and I, I know as I said there's there's challenges about about that but like what is to say that girls physically can play with boys and um, whether that's tag rugby or ripper rugby or or whatever version of that or touch rugby before you know and after 11 obviously in 12 that that starts to change but I understand culturally there's there's, there's other things that Will get in the way and teachers and influence and all of that stuff and um, but I, I think another part a huge part of it is 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 coaching as well and, and just ensuring that um if we can if we can if we can invest in a in a in a in, a, in an environment whereby you know girls are, are invited into a safe environment whereby they're encouraged to to grow and they see rugby as a as a vehicle that allows them to have fun have a good experience we know that if we have a good experience and are enjoying something we'll stay at it if we stay at something we're going to get better at it and i think coaching is a really key part to that and um, and then it's about like linking up all of the things so we like we, re we we do have to be having discussions with schools and clubs and and, and universities etc to try and generate those competitions because look as players they just need competitions to get better and I, like i'm not saying that this is easy at all and ashton and isla know way more of the realities but like these are some of the kind of fundamentals that we're we're talking about and throwing around um but uh but yeah so look it's a, it's a big old project but genuinely I, I think i'm hearing lots of positive things and there's lots of initiatives from the government there's lots of mandates to try and drive better better equality from a gender point of view as well you know so there's a, there are more open doors now that, that i feel very lucky that i can i can try and and, and push those open doors and, and i definitely will and i and i and i know that Ashen and Isla have had had a lot of closed doors, and um, but I definitely will push them, and I see a lot of people opening them too, you know. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll make some ground in that. No doubt that we'll 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 re re meet resistance at some stage, but we'll keep on pushing till we get there.
<laughs> yeah, those 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 mainstream rugby schools. Good luck if you can break them down. I live in I live in the Winelands. I'll buy you a, a large case of wine for that. No problem. <laughs> I know I know because it, it would just be fantastic. There's so there are there are a lot of girls out there that would love to play rugby. I know there are. I've met them. Um, I know your time's short, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep sort of badgering you now. Unfortunately, one of the things that is gonna be it is going to be a struggle is that relationship building with um, different organizations. It's an incredibly diverse country. Um, people operate in, in, in considerably different ways right across the spectrum. But I, I want to use the example of SASCOC. I'm not picking on, I'm just using that. The, the SA women's rugby team qualifies for the Tokyo Olympics. And then SASCOC stand in the way and say the, the qualifying tournament was not of a high enough level, you're not going. I will never see the positive, uh, the positive side of them doing that whatsoever. Are you worried about some of the relationships that are strained and build and could hamper a lot of what you want to put in place? Yeah, look, and again, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not for one second um, trying to um, imply that that this is going to be simple at all. But look, I, I, the Olympic uh, pathway is a is a vital one, um, because we can talk about infrastructure, we can talk about philosophies of of when the girls are there, etc. But if the girls don't know that there is an aspirational pathway, if they don't know that there's actually something for them to aspire to you know they're not actually going to want to to know even what rugby is and and we know the visibility the kind of can't see can't be is an absolutely essential essential visibility piece role models essential you know like why are we where we are at all it's it's often what we've seen or the people that have influenced or, or had a word in our ear or that teacher that said you can do that or or you know you're really fast or whatever so all of these little things are really really important and we know in particular that the girls that we want to be interesting at the moment are 13, 14, 15 year olds because they'll, they'll be the ones that are coming of age in, in 2029. And, and what influences those girls? Teenagers are influenced by their friends, they're influenced by social media, what they see, and they're influenced by their, by their coaches, etc. So <clears throat> the, the, the visibility of, of global events like World Cups are, are essential to try and capture the hearts of the girls and um, to be able to want to want to do that and, and go. And then we need to we need to provide a club that they go to locally and then they actually have a good experience. So that's kind of all of the link for the Olympics is, is huge. Like it's absolutely huge. And if we look at Spanish rugby at the moment, like Spanish rugby is no right in the world to be really good and, a, and an aspirational women's team, but they are only because their women's team got to the Olympics and did a really good job of leveraging the interest that's there. So, you know, it, it is really tough and, and like Isla and Ashland will know some of the girls that, that went through that experience and, like that's really gutting and you know there's there's one or two of them that have gone through it twice um so we want to be able to change that we, there's also an incentive even at a at a junior olympics you know just we just need girls to get as much representative experience possible so through the olympics or whether through the junior olympics we need them to be playing in that in that competition so look it'll be something that we'll 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 start the conversations we'll put in proposals and, and we'll keep that that conversation open because it, it needs to be <clears throat> a part it needs to be a part of of all of this kind of build towards um, allowing girls to see what's possible. And, and it's obviously a big global event that, that allows that to be possible. Yeah, absolutely. Ilza, from your side of things, you, you mentioned sevens <laughs> earlier. And I've always sort of had the, arg the, the, the argument um, the, with global rugby as well as SA rugby uh, on the women's side, but global rugby generally, that if you were to package a game and go into India and put it on the table and say, now you can play rugby. Sevens would be a lot easier to package than 15s, just for its simplicity. Um, do you think that it should be top of the agenda in South Africa, sevens, to get a really competitive sevens team in the short term, would attract players, then you concentrate on the 15? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I do believe that 15s is a fantastic package game. Uh, it's quick. It's it. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it it also as a as a player develops you, um, and it actually makes you a better 15s player. So, from from my 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 perspective, I would say yes. In a country like South Africa, 
give the girls sevens and and let them play sevens and develop the game from the sevens platform um so so that everybody know that they can take part but it, it like lynn said it's really important to 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 let girls know that if you can't see it you can't be it um uh, during the 2017 World Cup in 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 Ireland, there was a massive push for for uh, women's rugby and to make women's rugby more visible. And I think that even though Ireland uh, didn't do as well in the in, in the competition, uh, the support was phenomenal for, for for women's rugby, and we did see a massive increase in the amount of um, girls who who started playing rugby and took rugby up. So in South Africa, with South Africa's um, diverse landscape um i do believe that 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 will definitely help yeah it's an interesting one link because they, they, if one country has managed to create a seven brand it's south africa with the blitz box is that is is sev do you see sevens as a, as a really key pathway yeah i do look i i think um I think there's there's lots of ways to look at it. I definitely think that it's an easier game to to roll out. Um, it's easy if you've got fourteen players. Ashlyn will know how hard it is to get girls down playing. So if you have fourteen of them, obviously it's easier than having thirteen of them or thirty of them to play against each other. Um, I think there's lots of transferable pieces. You know, the, if you asked Paul Dalport, obviously the the sevens, the women's sevens, he'll he'll say that. It's a, it's a better vehicle to learn all of the skill, skills in rugby because as a sevens player, you need to be fast. You need to know how to rock. You need to know how to kick. You need to know how to sidestep and pass and all of that stuff, whereas 15s is more specific. Uh, but then you could argue if you're a 15s romantic, then you could argue the skills of a 15s player tactically um, can transfer to the sevens. So I do see it as a vehicle. I think it's easier to bring into schools, etc. But I don't see, I don't, what I don't buy into is that it's 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 brought into teams and uh, environments as a way to just harness sevens and and against 15s i definitely don't think i think at the start of sevens probably in error maybe or you know everybody had the right intention was that <clears throat> the hope was it would come and, and take over over 15s in the women's game and, and i think it's been proved wrong because I think the you know the, the heritage of the 15s game and the inclusiveness of the 15s game has, has shone true. And if anything, um, the 15s game has homed a lot of the sevens players through COVID, you know. So I think we'll see it, an interest and kind of picture emerge the other side of it in women's rugby. And um, I think what you're here across the world as well is that you've got more teams. I think the uh, the idea at the start, everybody presumed that the two games would completely separate because that's what has happened from a men's point of view. And I, and I don't think you'll see that from a women's point of view. And if anything, unions are, are starting to look at dual players and hybrid players more um, because of just that relationship in the women's game. And ultimately, it's probably because, probably because there's not enough people in, in the women's game that can play both codes. But that kind of seems to be the dynamic at the moment. So to answer your question, I, I do think that there's a strong heritage for sevens um, in South Africa. I, I'd like to see a place where we can have a, a, a system, like we've 19 contracted players now and eight of them are, are the sevens players that have that have been contracted already. I'd like to see a, a, a place whereby we can prioritize per year or per cycle, you know, what we do and what we focus on because um, I, I think there's, there's huge potential in both. Yeah. Ashim, what are you, what are you seeing the girls getting more joy out of on the field the sevens or the 15s andy um yeah <laughs> sevens is more entertaining but i believe um I'm, I'm i'm a fan of both and we need both in south africa um because like you also said it's a diverse country we come with different shapes and sizes um, but with my time in kenya when i was coaching kenya um I think that worked well there, and I think that will fit nicely in South African women's rugby. Is a, it's a tense league. Um, instead of a focus for development on uh, on, on, on 15s, I would say um, introduction introduction of tennis side rugby, especially primary school rugby mm -hmm. level. I have done it here in Eisner um, when I introduced um, primary school girls rugby. Um, we use tens as a format um, because of numbers. And it catered for both your, your bigger player and your faster player. 
And um, going nationally, I would say the ideal for me would be a 30, 40 player um, contracted squad by SA Rugby, fitting both 15s and 7s within a one week calendar of training schedules um, and developing both because. Um, while 15 skater for all of your players, all sets and sizes, sevens allows um, for better skill um, development for players. And that is very important. Um, Lynn was uh, talking about um, the relationship with Sasskirk and, and how important um, playing on that stage was for, for South African women's rugby. Um, and we, we, we didn't qualify. Not really because of the, the, the level of, 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 how do you call it, the level of the, the qualifying tournament. Um, it's because we didn't, we didn't qualify through the, the, the World Series. And if you go back to 2012-2013 season, we competed very well with your um, England, with your uh, Australia. They both have become champions in times or within the top two or three for, for, for a long period. And in 2012, during the Dubai Sevens, we actually won our first game against England um, and set up our first final. So we are good enough. We just need to uh, make sure that once we, um, once we set up the structures, that we don't shift in and out. Because when the 15th coat was cancelled out um, to focus on development from grassroots upwards, there was a bigger focus on Sevens. And I, 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 I'm a big fan of, of Paul at the moment because he managed to turn the program in the right direction. But just as he was getting in the direction where we need to go towards the next Olympics, um, it seems like the program will be cut again and now it will shift to 15th. While we need to um, give attention to both because we are good enough to compete. I remember in 2013 with Aslam Abrams at the coach of the 15th program. Um, we went for the first time, I think, in the history of South Africa. We went until the last minute in nearly beating England. We lost to England in the in the 78th minute with one point. Um, so we have we have the bullet in both, and um, I won't say Sasha was wrong by denying South Africa opportunity um, because we need to strive to medal when we go to Olympics, because we need to create um, heroes. We need to create winning heroes. Um, and we have the ability to medal if we get everything right. But what I've seen was when um, I was coaching with, with uh, Kenya, um, when the team went to the Olympics in 2016, um, when they get back, immediately there was a bigger hype. More people was interested. And if you look at where Ken Kenya is currently, um, they had a very good place, and I firmly believe um, the, the experience they, they gained in in in, in Rio um, helped very much for the ladies to to be where they are currently. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Aslam, Aslam's watching tonight, so good evening to you, Aslam. It's great to uh, see you involved, and uh, obviously see you back coaching now as well with Eastern Province, which is great. Uh, Lynn, you mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to ask Gills, uh, the Rugby World Cup 2021 has been postponed, which obviously everyone's gutted about. Um, but is that a blessing in disguise for South Africa because it gives them, on a personal level, it gives Lynn a year to... Sorry, uh, it's and you, can, you might hear it in the background. That's okay, no way. But is it a blessing in disguise for South Africa that actually they've got another years of, year of development? Because... We are we are seeing the progress in South Africa. It's not stood still. Like we're starting to see the women's captain on the front of magazines, which is fantastic. We're starting to see her get some. We're starting to see the team get some publicity, which is brilliant. And we're starting to see some powerful figures for other girls to follow. But on the pitch, is another year actually just a blessing in disguise? I think that another year for not just South Africa, but for Ireland as well, is a blessing in disguise because it gives. <laughs> It gives the teams um, a little bit more time to focus on some of the skills that they need to um, develop a bit better, uh, especially with the Springboks who hasn't played. That they haven't really played any 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 international rugby since the Scotland Tour of 2019. 
Um, and it's 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 a it's difficult. It's difficult to international player going out against the likes of teams like England and France and um, New Zealand. If if you don't have that um, experience of 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 playing under pressure, so I do think another year will give South Africa a really good opportunity to to actually put their hand up and say, look, guys, we're back. And, and it's it's time for them to show because South African rugby has got amazing girls playing rugby. Um, the talent pool in South Africa is huge, and the <laughs> girls want to play, and that is what makes this appointment so exciting. I think like, I've had friends phoning me from in South Africa saying that, uh, "What do you know about this Lynn girl?" I'm like, "Guys, <laughs> she's amazing at what she does," and. Uh, I don't know who's more excited, Len, about you coming out, the South African Women's Rugby Republic or Jenny Murphy, but because um, she's already planning holidays. Um, but <laughs> I do believe that with your with, with Lynn's input and um, smoothing out the, the, the skill sets that these girls need, people are going to be in for a massive surprise with the Springbok women. Who's going to play in the in, in the next World Cup? Yeah, absolutely, Lynn, Lynn. From your side of things, from within the organisation, I suppose, um, is there a sense of relief? Not because the standards not good enough, but more the fact that you're going to be underprepared anyway because of this flipping disease um, for this virus. So, is it is it more a relief that you, that everyone's got a chance to put their stamp on a Springbok national team? Yeah, definitely. Look, um, we're 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 relieved. Um, but equally, we've only spent the last forty-eight hours just kind of digesting it, and we have to be respectful as well of athletes and coaches and management all work in cycles, don't they? So there is going to be a reality that you know other people will have had thoughts of what will happen next for them, and you know it takes some time for them to adjust uh, to it. Um. There's, in, in the women's game, naturally, you'll, you'll have women that will want to stop and start families. And you'll always have those girls that are closer to retirement, too. You know, so I think that's where my mind goes originally with these adjustments. But in general, like we, we've got this just amazing uh, sports psych who, who's working with the girls, Bianca, and she's working with them to, to talk to everybody to just make sure that everybody's on the pay, same page. But the girls met today and the just resounding response has been just really, really positive and embracing all of the things that you guys just said, that it's just more time to get better. And like the conversation that we had with Rassi was that like in 12 months time, we have to make sure that we're 12 months better at everything, you know, co from a coaching point of view and a strength and conditioning. And I say that, um, I, I, I say that, I, I know that you're mentioning me there and a lot of this and, and like, I definitely want to influence it, but like Stanley Rubenheimer is the head coach and, and Eddie and Lungi are, are the assistant coaches. You know, they've got a really, really great staff. And they're the ones, for me, I, my job is just to support them in, 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 in making sure that they have everything that they need to so that they can be thriving as a, as a management team so that the girls can thrive underneath them. So kind of that's my job. But if anything, today we, we had a good chat around, look, well, what, what if we have more time now, do we truly reflect on on the approach that we're taking even within that team um, and 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 just double check that we're going the direction that we want. So I suppose that's kind of, that's the attention to detail we're, we're, we're kind of afforded now um, at, a, at a team point of view. But as I said, pretty much coming into the job for me, I, I've been just kind of stand, standing back and, and letting the guys do what they have been doing because I just don't want to be disruptive. And, and a lot of my focus then has been in the bigger picture stuff outside of it. So either way, we've got we've got more time for both, which I think is an overall positive. That's amazing. And when when do you plan to actually be over here, actually, with this COVID? And... <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to be over there tomorrow because then I can... It's lovely and warm, car. I must say. It's like 30 <laughs> degrees in Pal. I'm loving life. It's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, I'm I, the, the home offices are all closed at the moment, so we're, our visas are, are just sitting there um, and COVID flights, we're obviously still in lockdown. But um, July is, is the hope that, that everything will be processed and I'll, I'll be there hopefully in July and moving my... And my family are, are really excited. Well, she's have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, so I don't know. They don't know about what happens tomorrow, let alone that we're moving to a different country. So let's yeah. hope that everything goes smoothly. But I've been very, like, like the guys, I've just felt very welcome. Um, 
with anybody that I've spoken to. So, um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. That's awesome. Actually, I'm going to put you on the spot now. I'm going to put uh, you and Lynn on the spot now. So Lynn gets off the plane and you're the person that meets her and you want to give her a piece of paper with the one thing, the one thing that if she could wave her magic wand, help sort out. What, what, what would it be at this current stage just to help with development and moving the game forward in SA? And uh, um, yeah, it's actually something I spoke to someone today about. Um, it is great um, relationship with organizations that's already busy uh, helping to create a high performance pathway. I know um, a few years back I spoke to the Tux coach, Rian, and he was of the same opinion that he's trying to reach out that there's some kind of a strategic um, relationship between SA Rugby and Tux. Um, I have done this job with the Titans Women's Rugby Academy and with the Gauteng um, Women's Rugby Institute that was also launched yesterday. Um, you have various role plays that can help in creating that high performance environment. And if that is the one thing um, that SA Rugby can, or Lynn can make happen, how they um, create a relationship where we get our high performance players, our national players, to be within this system, with these organizations, or let they help to develop the next generation of um, players. I know how the Women's Rugby Institute that was launched yesterday um, started off with 30 players. We have about um, 25 players with us who are also in a high performance program. So if that relationship with these kind of organizations um, can be established, it would be great for Women's Rugby. Yeah, amazing. And Ilza, you've got the second piece of paper because I know your heart's still in South Africa. Your heart's still in South Africa. You can, you can wear a different green shirt, but we know where it is. What's on your piece of paper? Um, on my piece of paper would be... <laughs> Give me a job. There's a, there's a, <laughs> relocation package. Relocation um, package. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually quite happy in Northern Ireland. Uh, it, it's a lot. I, I can't see myself shipping from from country to country every ten years. Uh, it, it's 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 um, as as nice as it is to have a different surrounding. It is a bit of a a bit of a bugger when it comes to visas. So good luck, Lynn. <laughs> <Happy then. laughs> um, no, what I would do is I would I would I would want I would want for there to be more role models. When when I was playing rugby, I knew the likes of Lynn and Grace, who coached me at my club, who I played rugby with when I first got it. I was like, oh my gosh, it's Grace. I'm a prop, so that that says a lot. Um, but coming to Ireland. I suddenly was playing with all these girls that we used to follow through the likes of Scrum Queens when you guys were playing Six Nations. And I know that your, your schedule for rugby wasn't that full back then. Um, but still, have more girls visible. Let people see. How, let young girls have role models. That is not your – And I've, again, I've got nothing against really skinny girls on the cover of magazines. But – they need to know that there's 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 girls like them who can be more than they are at the minute and you, you hinted on education and sport earlier and that's another thing in south africa the more girls you can keep in education the higher the chance of keeping them in sport and and giving them giving them a realistic future because there's so many of these girls that are growing up below the poverty line, below the bread line, and let them make make a difference. Make a difference to those girls who has the potential to play rugby. Yeah, absolutely agree. And, and, and Ireland learned a very valuable lesson last year when they didn't use the players for their for their kit launch. Um, but <laughs> but I think it's, it's it, I think it is a valid point. It was a shocking decision, but that's Ireland anyway. But yeah, I completely agree with you that we need to get, not superstars, because you don't want to force that onto people, but there are, everyone's got a story. And in South Africa, more sports people have got stories than most countries in the world. Not that you need to play on it or over-sensationalise it or Hollywood it up, but 
these people, there are a lot of players out there that have come from very, very little and have done extremely well. And they should be completely used as role models. Lynn, I know you're probably freezing in London now, but yeah, thank you so much, so much for your time this evening. If you ever need to use our platform again to get a message out there, you know where we are. Um, and good luck with the move over. Where, where, where will you be based? Uh, Cape Town, I, but I've no oh, idea. Okay. Um, we haven't looked into it at all yet. And, and like, thank you for having me, but I'd love to stay in contact with Ash. And like, one of the things I'm conscious of, I've been trying to talk to as many people as, as I can so far. Um, we're conscious that until we have a, a good, our feet under the table with regard to like what we can do, what needs to be done, um, it's important before we, we speak to literally everybody, but I'd love all of the, 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 the all of the unions all of the women's coordinators all of the coaches and beyond that from a, from a provincial point of view are going to be so important to, as to to build this community uh, that we need to in order for this to to do well so i'm looking forward to meeting Ashen and um i'll definitely stay in touch and thanks for having me on the show no, absolute pleasure and i'm just in pal just down from cape town in the wineland so ah, if you ever, ah. need, ever need a, if you ever need a wine farm tour Bring the family down. We're on it. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm a tour rugby. Ashin, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Keep doing what you're doing as well, mate. I love your social media. I love what you're doing with the girls. I actually love the fact that you've been giving us all an insight in, into how a, a, a high development performance works. You don't, you don't, uh, you don't post the glamorous stuff. You post the girls working seriously hard, and I love that. So keep doing what you're doing. And Ilza, as always, absolute pleasure. Um, good luck with your business endeavours as well. And um, guys, thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, there are some shows coming up uh, on Sunday. We have the South African Ulster star. Just South Africans everywhere. South African Ulster star Lewis Ludic. <laughs> um, his company, We Are Hellbent, have their first pilot episode live. So join that. He is great value. There's no doubt about it. The man is great value. Uh, so check out their Facebook page as We Are Hellbent. Next Wednesday, uh, the New England Free Jacks, uh, Mr. Dallin Stanford will be sending his 700 clips and pictures to Joe very shortly, no doubt. Um, that's called Let's Ride. Um, it's a, that's a brilliant show, great show uh, to look into the MLR as well. Uh, and finally, next Thursday, we move out of the way and let the Leinster Lion come on live at 8.30 in Ireland. Guys, thank you so much. I love talking about women's rugby. It's so it's great to get the passion out there and and it has a massive place in world rugby and show it should continue to move forward and lynn go for it we're all behind you and we hope to see some serious success until next time guys thank you so much good night welcome 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 to the show